Here is one of a series of talks by spiritual leader Lola McDowell Lee, spanning two decades from the early 70s through the 90s. Lola was a Zen Roshi, whose Rinzai lineage included Dr. Henry Plutov and renowned Zen master Shigetsu Sasaki. Lola was a religious scholar as well as an ordained Christian minister. While the talks are focused mainly on Zen and Buddhism, Lola drew on many spiritual traditions, including those of Jesus, Plato, Lao Tzu, the Hindu Vedas, Meister Eckhart, and Gurdjieff. I'm doing a little thing this morning, uh, again out of uh, Lao Tzu's book, The Tao Te Ching. Uh, the uh, <clears throat> Lao Tzu uh, lived in China about 2,500 years ago, and um, when he was leaving the country, he, he wanted to, he disappeared. But when he was leaving, uh, his uh, students came after him, and the, uh, the, the emperor's guard came after him to try to prevent this. And they had a tax at that time. Uh, if you went through the gate, you had to pay a tax. So, and he didn't have any money, so they asked him um, if he would write some of his teachings. So he wrote this little book, which is called the Tao Te Ching, or the Canon of Reason and Virtue, uh, sometimes called the Simple Way. And, um, <clears throat> anyway, we've gone through quite a bit of it already, but here we have the little stanzas this morning. Thirty spokes unite in one nave, and on that which is non-existent, hmm, it's the hole in the nave, depends the wheel's utility. Clay is molded into a vessel. And on that which is non-existent, on its hollowness, depends the vessel's utility. By cutting out doors and windows, we build a house. And on that which is non-existent, that is the empty space within, depends the house's utility. Therefore, existence renders actual but the non-existence renders useful. Now, for this morning, you know, I talk about existence quite a bit, but for this morning, let us say that the way things appear to you is existence. What is here? that you call a rose. You call it a rose. That's its name. And you even go further and say it's pink and it's white and there's a little yellow in it. And so you give a description. But what is it? If you cannot call it any name, what is it? If you could see it with an inner eye rather than its appearance, what is it? What is it? And I look at you, and I say to you, or I ask of you, who are you? Who are you? Hmm? You set aside your private mental world, hmm? your feelings, your judgments, and all of that, the invisible of you. Who are you? In that, who are you? Hmm? Those who view existence, life, huh? superficially. And they take the superficial to be the be-all and end-all of everything. huh? And they fail to see the usefulness of non-existence. There seemingly is nothing existing where I'm waving my hand, seemingly. Hmm? So they recall it non-existence. What really is here, um, you don't know. We call it empty. Hmm? We call it empty. Hmm. Those who confine themselves to the superficial, you know, and, and to 
their own reason and logic and won't move from it, and they don't go into the, the depths of themselves, they, they cannot begin to understand that what we call non-existence is the support of that which is present or actual. Hmm? John Crawford, you know, Elsa Crawford's husband, you know, when he was alive, he taught mathematics in Chicago to the uh, retarded children. He was the first one in the city of Chicago, in the state of Illinois, for that matter, that had a class in, in uh, mathematics for the handicapped, mentally retarded children. And he taught them, he was a good teacher, he taught them that in mathematics, the most useful is zero. Everything comes from zero, and everything returns to zero. From zero comes one, comes one, comes one, comes one, comes one, and we finally call it many. We have the appearance of many. But nothing has departed from this non-existence, this zero. Nothing has departed from it. Aren't you sitting in, 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 in emptiness now? Huh? You haven't departed from it. Huh? All this world huh, that we are today calling existence, you know, all this in the non-existence, about it. Hmm? The way it is and the way it appears are two aspects. In other words, they're two different points of view. The way it is, it's isness, the way it is and the way it appears. Both right here. But two points of view. Hmm? Now, one of the basic tenets of uh, the teachings of Lao Tzu, uh, of Taoism, is based on polarities. The, the symbol of, of Taoism... Oh, I got a piece of chalk this morning. <laughs> forgetting that one is in the other. That's the symbol of Taoism, of the polarities. The light and the dark moving, and then moving, and then moving, and then moving. And we call them sometimes yin and yang, and uh, or male and female. Polarities coming together, moving through each other, and parting, and coming together, and moving through each other. So, you know, and this is life. And uh, sometimes it appears to us that uh, it all seems such a contradiction. Uh, life seems to be, or existence, you know, seems to be so many paradoxes. And yet life collaborates with what we think are counterforces. You have someone, maybe, that you don't like, or finally you wind up with someone that you call an enemy. Hmm? And the enemy dies. Well, it would seem that because the enemy died, you would be a happier person. But when the enemy dies, something within you also dies. Hmm? Something existed in you because of an enemy. Opposition. So you call it enemy, huh? This opposition, it wakens something in you. It's a kind of a challenge, you know. And something which, unless you had this challenge, may have lain dormant and never risen into objectivity for you, into an act actuality. So what you call enemy, in a way, influences our life. 
And we can observe this happening and not go down under it. We can just observe that something is rising and cope with it. Yeah. You know, like a person like Mahatma Gandhi. You know, he might have passed a life, had a life that was completely unknown, except for the enemy, and that was British rule. He had to overcome the British rule uh, for himself and for his people, you know. And this fight then brought him into prominence and developed him. If the British had not been there, you probably would have never heard of Mahatma Gandhi. See? So a life that was very difficult. It brought out his courage. Brought out, shall we say, his manhood. A life that's all peaches and cream is peaches and cream. Hmm? Yeah. And in the great Samukhya yoga system, and they talk about Purusha, which is the self. The unknown self. And this unknown self uh, has lost himself in the play of the Pakrit, which is the great mother. We call it Mother Nature, huh? The great mother. And uh, this self, then, or this Purusha, must extricate himself from the, the, the play of the mother. In other words, that unknown self, or that impersonal self, in you must extricate itself from your world and stand separate and be able to look at all this play. Hmm? And in the Hindu and the Buddhist Tantra systems, you know, they speak of Shiva and Shakti, the masculine and the feminine that unite. They're forever passing by each other and not uniting. So this creative power in this particular philosophy of the Tantra, the creative power, Shakti, is they call God the Mother. Hmm? And in this particular system, uh, God the Mother is mind, and what we call mind and matter. It's your world. It's, it's everything that, this whole activity that we call universe. Now, this uh, Shakti is not separate, that is, distinct from what they call Brahman, what we would call God. It's not separate from, but is the power thereof. Hmm? So that in an absolute existence, which is a transcendental state, hmm, the unchanging the unmoving is known as Shiva. So you have the unmoving and you have the moving. You have the unchanging and you have the constant change. Shakti and Shiva. Yeah. The active aspect, the way we know the universe, is the play of Shakti. Yeah. You know, in an old prayer book of the Shakti Tantra, we find a little, this, this prayer. O oh Mother, Thou art the embodiment of all knowledge. Wherever there are intelligence and learning, there art Thou manifest. All women are Thy form. Thou hast Thy being in the universe, filling and permeating all things. This power. Anyway, that's the way they, they view the thing, and that's their philosophy. So the activity of Shakti, this power, hmm? the play, is the wooing of Shiva. All this moving is to attract the attention of that which doesn't move. Hmm? And when they unite, then you have the absolute, which is called Brahm. Now, that's, that's that particular system and how they describe it. Hmm? Now, without Shakti, or without Pakrit, now we can use the same, you know, without the mother. We cannot come to know the father. We cannot come to know this power. A child, a baby, uh, knows its mother first. And through the mother, then, begins to know the father. Baby knows everything through the mother. It is not different. 
Know your femininity. And you will come to Shiva. Huh? This power hmm, of the Shakti and this other, huh? I don't care what you call it, huh? See? But through this power, this activity, it is through this activity that we are in that we can come to know God. Hmm? The feminine and masculine polarities uniting. Now, they should not be viewed as opposites. No. They are polarities. They are partners. They are collaborators. They relate to each other. Therefore, it is a relativity. One aspect, shall we say the feminine, allows the other aspect, the masculine, to be actualized, to come into view, to be known. If you had no body... No senses, no body, no mind. Huh? How would you come to know spirit? Hmm? Without the play of the mother, the father would never be actualized. These seeming opposites that work together. You know, you can take such a thing as electricity. Electricity exists because there is a negative and a positive pole. You take away one, and the other one automatically disappears. Hmm? You would have no electricity, you have no polarity, you've got no nothing. you got a bunch of dead wires. Hmm? They're partners, intimate partners. Yeah. However, with us, to see the other side, the relativeness of what we are viewing at the moment is difficult. To see, for the individual, to see the seeming opposite is very difficult. But Lao Tzu says that for a person who does, that person is wise. There is a wisdom there. Hmm? Who at least tries. Yeah. So wherever we look, in any direction and in all directions, we see opposites. We've got near and far and high and low and black and white and you name it. Hmm? All these seeming opposites. We're very strange. Mm -hmm. We always have a tendency to overlook one. One or the other, we overlook. See? We see one side and we forget the other. See? We look at one aspect we're completely oblivious of the other. We look at a rose, but we don't look at the thorn. The flower and the thorn grow on the same bush. They're fed by the same channel. They're alive because of one root. The same gardener waters the bush, the flower, and the thorn, and the same sun shines on them both. They come from the same existence. We look at the rose, we forget the thorn. And the more we forget the thorn, the sharper it pricks. Yeah. And when the thorn pricks, the flower vanishes from our sight. Hmm? Now we're focused on the thorn. We're only aware now of the pain of the thorn. We even forget that it was because of the rose that we got tangled up with the thorn. We forget that. Yeah. We enjoy the aroma of the flower, and the pain is a result. See, over and over and over and over and over and over we do this to ourselves. See, you know, it's partial vision, I guess I can call it, huh? Partial vision, see only one side. Now, partial vision, vision is not wrong. It's only incomplete. It's a kind of an ignorance, huh? It's only half of what is. See? And the other half seems so contradictory, see, it's so paradoxical that we can't seem to relate one to the other. So we ignore one because it isn't logical to bring it in. It, it, they don't relate. But life changes, our existence changes every moment. Hmm? Out there yesterday morning, there was nothing, and now we got 
some walls. We've got to have a structure or some of a structure, huh? Nothing is stable. Everything is mutable. Hmm? We swing from one aspect to the other. We don't stand aside and let the aspects go back and forth in front of us. No, we're swinging, you know. And when we swing way over to one side, that's what we see. And then we swing over to the other side, and that's what we see, huh? But in the profound depths of, what shall we say, non-existence are united. They're not separate at all. Huh? Only on the surface of things do they seem separate. Only on the periphery. And he who sees only the surface doesn't understand Lao Tzu. Because he points to the polarity and the unity thereof. And he says that little things like, uh, on the surface, it is not clear. But in the depth, it is not obscure. He uses such beautiful language, huh? Yeah. So, now, 30 spokes of the wheel combine at the center. Hmm? The usefulness of the wheel depends on the empty space at the hole, you know, the little hub in the center. You know, because of that emptiness, the wheel can go around. See? So the movement of the cart or the movement of your car because of the wheels depends on the emptiness at the center of the wheel. Now, the function of a human being, the movement of a human being depends on what? How you function? How you operate? With what? Hmm? What's within you that allows you to do this? On what does appearance depend? You know, there was a, a long time ago when Buddha was alive, you know, he had left his, his uh, family estate to the palace and he didn't want to be king. He was his prince, but he gave it all up and became a beggar. He went around India with a begging bowl until he attained enlightenment, and then he set himself up as a teacher. <clears throat> Rather, the other teachers there came and asked him, please, would he? Anyway, uh, one day, a king came to him and said, you know, you had everything that a man could desire. You know, why did you leave the palace and your parents? Hmm? Sometimes, in the heat of stress, uh, one tends to make uh, rash decisions. You know, he told me he had a fight with his parents or something, you know, whatever. But don't worry. You don't worry, you know. Your father is a good friend of mine, and he will listen to me and take you back. And if for some reason you don't feel that you should be under anyone's obligation, I have a daughter. You can marry her, and you can be the master of all I possess, for I have no son. And all this while the king is talking to him about all these things that he's willing to give him and willing to do for him. He never looked at him. Never looked at him. But when he was all through speaking, finally he looked up at the Buddha and said, What do you have to say? And the Buddha smiled and he said, You think I have no possessions. I think you have none. Huh? But you are right, and so am I. Huh? Only our ways of thinking are different. Huh? You have everything outside of you. I have nothing around me. It's natural that you should pity me and try to help me to return, you know, to the riches that I left. But I see myself as being filled within, and I see there is nothing within you. I have known both kinds of riches. What you offer me is nothing. And so I say unto you, King, I now possess everything. Before I had nothing. You have only had one experience, riches, the wealth of the world. Now know the other, the wealth of the spirit. You know, become a monk and be filled. You know. I would imagine, this is, I mean, this is not part of the story, I would imagine that the king must have thought something. You know, I come here and I offer him, you know, my daughter, my kingdom, my money, my gold, my palace, everything. And he says to me, become a beggar. <laughs> huh? Yeah. Anyway, a pot is formed of clay, and its use lies in its emptiness. 
Water can be put into emptiness. Milk can be put into emptiness. Dirt can be put into emptiness. Beer can be put into emptiness. You name it, it can be put into emptiness. So the actual pot is the space within. But what is visible to the eye when you look at a pot is the walls of the pot, huh? That to you is the pot, not the emptiness. When you buy a pot, you buy the wall, you know? But at the same time, you are buying its emptiness. You wouldn't buy a pot that was solid, would you? No. Well, maybe you would. <laughs> huh? It has no use, no matter how beautifully decorated it is. You know, how, if the vessel isn't empty, it's useless. It defeats the purpose for which it was, for which you buy it if you can't use it. You know. That which is not empty cannot be filled. It is already. Mm. 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 If you are not empty, with what are you filled? And then Lao Tzu goes on to talk about the houses that we build. See? What is a house? See? What is this chapel? It's a house. Huh? We're sitting here, and we say we're sitting in a building that we call a chapel. Hmm? But if you would ask this man, Lao Tzu, if you could, he would say, we're sitting in emptiness. Hmm? The building consists of the walls on the four sides, and nobody sits in the walls. You're sitting in the emptiness. Hmm? The walls serve to divide the space. And the use of the house is its emptiness. Hmm? We cut doors and windows. We divide it into rooms. But the use of the house depends on its emptiness. Now, do you realize that when you are building a structure, you are building an emptiness? Hmm? You are creating an emptiness. We don't think of that. We design the walls and the doors and we look at that, you know, but you're shaping emptiness with walls and doors and windows, huh? <clears throat> Unknowingly, we are giving a kind of a shape to this zero. The walls are visible. The form is visible. But the invisible, the formless, the emptiness, that which is useful and the most precious, we don't even think about. You know, and in our lifetime, many times, we fall in love. And we are so busy getting acquainted and so fascinated, you know, with this other person. And uh, the, there is this sexual attraction. And so you love his body. He loves her body. And, you know, no, no. what is behind all of this? Hmm? Well, it's kind of like going to buy a pot. Huh? <laughs> you, come, you become so entranced and enchanted with the art of the potter, you know, and the designer and the design on the pot that you forget to notice, is there enough space for the pot to hold water? Attracted by the looks of something, and later, you know, when it falls apart, I was a fool. Hmm? And I regret my error of judgment. The only error in the instance is just simply this. The other person is not significant because of body alone. There's got to be something else. The body is necessary. That's how you actualize the something else, huh? But that which we call emptiness in a person 
is the excellence of a person. Okay. That invisible, non-existent, that you could call Purusha, you could call Ataman, it's translated as self. The excellence of a person. And now, if someone comes along and says some derogatory things about you, or you take them to be derogatory, immediately, anger. Hmm? It's a mechanical response. Someone else comes along and praises you, and you feel elated. Hmm? Again, a mechanical response, just as mechanical as pushing a button. Somebody pushes a button and you respond. Yeah. Somebody pushes a button and automatically you feel either happy or miserable. Somebody embraces you and you're all turned on. Somebody turns their back and... Hmm. Miserable, huh? How much we go through in a little span of 24 hours? Huh? All these people pushing buttons all the time. You're in business and people come in and each one of them push a button with you. Everybody pushing buttons and you reacting accordingly. Within 24 hours, just look at 24 hours of your day. And then look at your life. Just mechanically responding to somebody pushing buttons. And you want to call yourself individual. Just fragments, you know, responding to buttons. And where is that which is individual? Where is the self? in all of this fragments responding hmm, to buttons. Uh, Tagore, he was a poet of, of India, and he wrote an epic poem about a monk and a, and a woman. Seems that a monk was passing through this village, <clears throat> and the village prostitute was standing up on her terrace and, you know, watching the road and, uh, in olden times. Uh, people didn't like the word prostitute, so they called them uh, the daughter-in-law of the town. <laughs> so this daughter-in-law is standing there on her terrace, and she's watching, and uh, she sees a young monk going down the road, coming up there. Now, she uh, was very attracted by him. If one has practiced meditation correct meditation, and if one has uh, had some proper discipline, it fills the person eventually with a particular kind of a force. You know, it, sometimes we can call it a power. The empty space is empty, and then you see what that emptiness really is, and this, and this force then becomes actual in the life, in the existence. It's no longer so hidden. Sometimes we call this beauty. Not beauty of face, but a beauty within. And these people who practice discipline, uh, they begin to have a kind of a freedom. You know, there, there isn't the bondage to the buttons anymore. You know, they can stand away from it and see uh, that they needn't respond. And you know, in, in doing this, you know, it gives a, a kind of a, uh, a unique power or beauty or dignity, you know. So that, you see, meditation allows this emptiness uh, to form within you. And then you can see that it is not empty, that empty is because of your eyes, and it is emptiness is a concept. And such a person no longer just lives, you know, with all these reactions. The buttons don't even sometimes attract his attention. Hmm. So one says he begins to live in his own way, which is another way. Hmm? And he is, in a manner of speaking, the owner of his life. You know, he has a dignity, and uh, he has an integrity, and there is humility, real humility. Huh. You know... 
to see the emptiness for what it is is so awesome that you cannot help but have humility. Anyway, this daughter-in-law of the town is standing on the terrace, and she sees this monk coming along, and he's got something, you see, and she falls in love with him. Boom. He pushed a button. There was something in her that responded to his dignity. So she came down from the terrace, and she approached him, and she asked him to be her guest for the night. And he looked at her, and he said, you have many to love you. You're young, and you're beautiful, and your night will not be lonely if I go away. But someday, when all your lovers discard you, someday when there is no one to hear your cry of anguish or your loneliness, I will come. Now, this was blow to her pride. I mean, nobody had ever refused her before, and she returned to her house with shame. Oh, uh-huh. it took her a long time to get over it, this rejection. Twenty years later, it was a very dark, moonless night, and uh, there was a monk coming down the road, and he heard somebody groaning over on the side in the ditch. And he stopped, and it was very, very dark, so he passed his hand over her face, you know, asking her what was the matter. And she said she wanted some water. She wanted some water to drink. So he went into the village, and he found the village well, and uh, he got a lamp, and he got the water, and when he came back in the light of the lamp, he recognized her. And it was the face of the woman who had invited him to stay with her 20 years ago. Um, Now she was a leper. And she was thrown out by the village people. No one even would bring her a drink of water. So he said to her, open your eyes and look at me. Twenty years ago, you invited me to stay with you. Now your invitation has reached me. I have come now because you need me. And she looked at him and she said, it would have been better if you had not come now. What's the use of coming now? You know, you should have stayed then when I was young and when I was beautiful, when I was desirable, you know. And kindly he said to her, but now you are more wise. Now you have known pain. Now you have known frustration. Today your body is nothing, but there is a glimmer of the self within. You see, now there was a button that he could respond to. Twenty years ago, you had a body and no self. Now the self is becoming actual. Hmm? So Lao Tzu says, therefore, existence (coughs) renders actual, but non-existence renders useful. So the emptiness is useful. Youth has its uses. Hmm? Yeah. It's a state. Being young is a state we use. You know, when youth is gone, there comes another state we use. And when that one is gone, there comes another state we use. I've gone from young to middle age to old age, right? The leaving of youth is is a very profound development in itself. And the leaving of this middle age into old age is a profound development in itself. And it is true that many people become old in body only. The understanding doesn't mature with it. It remains at the level of a child. You know? And it is strange, too, you know, about consciousness. There's something within us. It doesn't seem to age. You know? When you dream about yourself, when you were a little child and you dreamt about yourself, you dreamt about yourself as an adult person. Hmm? And when we were, you know, middle age, our middle age, or however, wherever you find yourself today, you know, you dream of yourself, you're somewhere between 28 and 35. That's about as old as you ever get, really. Huh? We're adults, and we dream about ourselves this way. We never dream about ourselves as being old. Hmm? 
I mean, say never, rarely, you know. Consciousness is consciousness, and in a dream, it, it, it comes out this way. It doesn't age. But, you know, we have a tendency to keep it behind closed doors. And who knows what happens behind closed doors? <laughs> huh? Right. We keep it confined with all the childish conditioning. Let it out. Huh? And so consciousness seems to remain childish. It doesn't, you know. It's a conditioning that is childish. We look within and we haven't aged. But somehow the body doesn't cooperate. <laughs> huh? You know, the mind, it doesn't get old. No. You know, somebody once said, inside every older person, there's a young person wondering what happened. <laughs> Yeah. Our existence, you know, whatever age, has its uses. You know. Why are you living? There must be some use to it, somehow, huh? Where you come from? Where are you going? Why are you here? You know, these are questions. To have answers to these questions, one seeks the non-existent. And there is a different meaning altogether for life. If we can touch that invisible, to really touch it, you know, we touch the support and the roots of ourselves. And we gather fresh energy for ourselves. You know, if you have a good night's sleep, you go to bed tired, and so you have a good night's sleep. You know, you wake up in the morning, and you've got a kind of a gleaming energy in your eyes. It's, it's like birds beginning to sing. Now you sleep at night, and you wake with a freshness, because you have touched your roots. And on those roots, you know, the, that rock, on that foundation, you built your house not on the shifting sands of the fragments of the personality, but on that empty, huh, that you touch, huh? See, so we go from appearance to roots, from the visible to the invisible. And birds and trees and animals and man, see, all do this, from the periphery to the roots. And it refreshes us. You know, people, you know, they look into this thing, why do we need to sleep? We need to touch home base. But, you know, it's like this little, this man that came from a little tiny village. And he went to visit a friend in a big, big city. And when he came back, the little village people asked him, what difference had he found between the village and, and the city life? And he says, there's a big difference, you know. In the village, the people go to sleep tired, they've done their day's work, and they get up in the morning and they're ready for another day's work. They're refreshed. You know, and, uh, the people in the city... They seem fresh in the evenings, and they get up in the morning tired. Hmm? The town hums with life, and it's all awake in the evening. In the morning, you find these people dragging around, and they get up with great difficulty, and they drag themselves to work. For work, they must. But they look like the spineless moving around in the morning. They're not refreshed by their sleep, and they should be, because you have touched home base. And these kinds of people, sometimes we find they talk a lot. They talk all the time. They're awake, and they talk when they're asleep. You even see it if they tell you their dreams. They're talking all night long, too. So there's 24 hours of babbling. Hmm? You know, and words are a kind of an existence. You know? Our thoughts exist in words. You know? Silence is the non-existence. You know? Silence is the emptiness. But not just blank. You shut off your mind and it's blank, but the real silence, huh? Mm -hmm. Silence is like a rock, you know? You know, you have some experience of this silence that is within you, you know? If you don't have the experience of this silence, you know, then you're filled with words. Words, 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 words. And where then is the profound depth of you? Words are useful, 
Hmm? But they're not an end in themselves. Words are necessary, but more important than words is no word. You know, out of the silence, the word is born. And there are those, uh, I've met a few, who know this silence, and when they speak, you know, their words are full of substance, they're full of something, you know. It said when the Buddha spoke, each word that he uttered had a kind of a magic of its own. I can imagine, huh? When Vivekananda spoke, they said it was like a silver stream flowing. And when Jesus began his ministry, he had 30 years of silence within him. So I can imagine the impact of his words. And these people use the same words as you and I use, the common language of the day. And you know, Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita, you know, he's in the chariot riding around with Arjuna, and Arjuna's having all this problem because there's this big war going on, and the people on the enemy are his relatives. You know, what's he going to do? And Arjuna and, and Krishna, uh, you know, is, is, uh, is in this chariot, and he talks to Arjuna. Nowhere did it say that Arjuna didn't understand what he said. He understood. And his words took on a very distinct quality. You read the book, you see it. It's, you know, it had a weight and a value to it. There's one meaning of the words, and that's in the dictionary. The other meaning of the word is that which comes through with a voice. Hmm? And if you can use the voice from that silence within, you got something else again. Hmm? So it was like the old Zen Roshi who said to the little student that was coming in, if you want to learn words, you go someplace else. If you want to learn silence, then you stay. We make use of words here, but only to point to the silence. Therefore, existence renders actual. And that's important. Therefore, existence renders actual. Now, most of you here that are sitting for meditation are working with some kind of a problem, and these prob- you're observing a problem, we, it's called, and these problems are sometimes called koans. Hmm. Now, to answer your observation of the koan, your answer comes out of the empty space, out of the silence. And that which is a non-existent should be made actual in the existence. Existing is the act, actual, actualize, act. Huh? The existence is acting the non-existence. Then you have observed your problem. It's no longer just a potential. So you actualize what you are as to what you know of yourself at that moment. Hmm? Therefore, existence renders actual. You understand? Existence renders actual. your arm like that? Huh? What is what is the force? What is the power with which you can wave your arm like that? What is it? See, and when you find it, you can come and make this force actual knowingly. Now it's present and you don't know it. When you know it, you actualize it.
but you've got to know it before you can make it actual. It is a knowing gesture. It is a knowing word. Hmm? Okay. And now, may the peace and the power that passeth all understanding hold us and keep us in the love of the Christed consciousness while we are seemingly separate one from another. And I thank you very much. If you find Lola's talks valuable, more will be posted in weeks to come.